Hello. Hi. How are we doing today? Uh, I'm well. Thanks for asking. Um, I'm Amanda. This is the Amanda Made It podcast, episode number four. Uh, this is a uh, place to have a conversation about what I make in my knitting, crocheting, and spinning life. Um, <clears throat> uh, I am doing this during nap time, and so I don't know how well this is going to go, but we'll, we will see. Um, I am a stay-at-home mom. I have a five-year-old and a almost one-year-old, and um, I am probably what you would consider an obsessive fiber artist. Uh, yeah, we'll go with that. Um, I have dabbled in the dyeing of the yarns, but it's just not a... Uh, easy thing to accomplish with having small children around um, unless I want to give up complete and total control which is not easy for me to do <laughs> when it comes to my creative things um, so anyway um, this episode I would like to share with you uh, a couple of whips and one tiny little fo um, I'm going to add that we are going into the gift making portion of the year. So, so some of the things that I am working on will not be shown because, um, the people who watch this <laughs> might be the people who are receiving them. Um, <clears throat> so there will be, uh, probably not a whole ton of lots of ton of things to show for the time being. And then January will just be like gangbusters with FOs. Um, and FOs for those who don't know means finished objects. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a rundown of some of the language that gets used in a um, fiber podcast such as this that involves knitting, crocheting, spinning, um, because I know that several people who watch this uh, don't know what the hell I'm talking about um, because they're my family and they're so very sweet and wonderful to support me and watch this. Um, and if you were finding me because you're brand new and um, you don't know what I'm talking about either because you are brand new, hopefully this will shed some light for you. Um, so in most knitting and crochet uh, fiber podcasts of this sort, discussions if you will, um, you will hear the terms FOs, um, UFOs, hose and uh, whips. An FO is a finished object. This means that the person has completed the process of making the object. Um, and finished can mean different things to different people, um, but it is still that person's version of a finished object, a finished thing that they are ready to wear, give, donate, whatever. Um, a unfinished object would be... <laughs> A not finished object. Uh, that's a UFO. Um, <clears throat> that is something that is um, perhaps perhaps in the works but most likely it is just something that's been languishing and it needs some love or it needs to get um, taken out because it's not going to get finished. Um, a ho or an HO is a half finished object. So this would be most of the time uh, seems to be referred to a pair of socks in which one sock is finished, a pair of mitts where one mitt is finished. Um, generally it's something where a completed project would require two two items um, to be completed. Um, and then whips are works in project, in progress rather. Um, so works in progress are things that you are actively working on. Now, some people have many whips and they categorize them as active whips or inactive whips or things in time out. Um, but active whips mean that they generally get some attention regularly. That may not be daily, may not be weekly, but regularly. It's like at the forefront of your making. Um, you know, if something's in timeout, generally it's probably pissed the maker off somehow. They can't, they screwed up a technique, they fucked something up, they didn't read the, the pattern right, or the pattern wasn't written right, um, which are all possibilities. There's many more things that could happen. Life happens, and all of a sudden the things that you were working on no longer take precedence or you realize that you need to make something else for some reason, <laughs> whatever that may be. Um, so I got those. Um, and I think that's enough 
educate. Oh, one other term that you will hear often is to frog something. Now, frogging is used to um, talk about when you're ripping a project out. When you're ripping your like, if you, if something doesn't work or you or don't like it or it doesn't fit and you need to undo the knitting when you do that you basically hold it and you just take your yarn and you just rip it out rip it out and rip it rip it frog that's where that comes from i first heard the term in debbie stoller stitch and bitch many many years ago i don't know where it originated um but that's a common common term used um also people also do also say rip it out um now let's get to i have one tiny little fo i can show you a finished object it is crochet isn't it so cute it's a tiny little crochet snowflake um i did this with like a size c crochet hook I don't know how many millimeters that is. Uh, it is done with um, number 10 cotton thread held together with a sequin thread. Um, neither of which I have right next to me. <laughs> so I can't, they're upstairs. So I can't show them to you, but I will show them to you next time. Um, I do this, I just think it's very pretty. And then, you know, you crochet it and it looks like a crumpled little mess of things. And then you soak it in some liquid starch which my husband was kind enough to pick up for me it's in the laundry area like i don't start shit for my clothes so i didn't know where i had to get it um <clears throat> like that's not my deal um so anyway you soak the thing in there you block it out which means you pin the item to a blocking mat which oftentimes looks like this and this is something that obviously can interlock with other pieces, so you can make a much bigger one. And you have little T pins, pins that look like a T. You know, the names are not like off the wall for a lot of things. Um, and because this is made of like a foam, like a thick foam, uh, the pins will stick into it and hold your uh, item in place while it dries and that can allow many different possible things to occur that you would like to have happen in your fabric so that is one finished object uh, I do have a couple of whips to show um, another crochet one uh, this is going to be a kind of crown um, it is, if I can remember, I gotta look it up because I don't remember the name of it. Um, but it's just a cute little crochet crown and um, I thought my kids would like it. So, um, the Princess of North Tiara. And it's kind of less of, it's a pattern, but it's a kind of more like a recipe. Um, and I'm trying to find and figure out who it's by. Oh, Nancy Gogolak. Don't know if I got that right, but um anyway, it's on Ravelry. That's where I found it. Uh and you know, it's very simple. I'm I'm doing it with a like a skein of white acrylic that I don't know where it came from. It's gotta be like one of those super saver red heart things. Um so it's perfect for like a crown. It's huge. I'm never, I don't know what, I'm, I'm just going to make stuff that I don't want for me out of it. <laughs> um, that my kids can destroy and it'll be okay. Uh, and then the other <coughs> work in progress, which I have shown before, is my cardigan. And this is from the Ann Buds Handy Book of Top Down Sweaters. So it's following more of a recipe using measurements. Um, I have completed the body portion of it. Um, you know, I made, I knitted to the length I wanted, knitting the ribbing as wide as I wanted. I'm definitely like, you can see the texture in this. That's not supposed to be there. That is called rowing out, which is where, because this is knit in the knit flat, not in the round. Um, 
it's just a thing that happens when your purl stitches are a different size than your knit stitches. Um, <clears throat> I don't feel like fixing it, so I'm not gonna. Well, I attempted to fix it, and it didn't seem to work. So, I'll take my lumps and <laughs> wear my weirdly stripy textured cardigan with pride. Uh, I <laughs> I am onto the sleeves. I have picked up stitches and started the sleeve cap. This is a set-in sweater, which I haven't done before. And a set-in sleeve is just a type of sleeve. Um, garments are typically made with <clears throat> several possible yoke and sleeve combinations. Um, you know, there's a round yoke sweater, there's a raglan, there's a set-in sleeve, there's drop shoulder. Um, and these are all just different versions of garment construction. Um, and you just try whichever ones you want. Um, I honestly didn't pay much attention to that in my clothes before. Um, although now I find myself recognizing these different things in clothing and, and recognizing why certain things don't look good on my body or why certain things may look great on other people, you know, which is interesting. Um, but not, uh, just a side effect of making your own clothes is that you notice things that you wouldn't have noticed before. Um, okay, so that's a whip and a finished object for knitting and crochet. Um, now on to spinning because this is what I have the most of and <clears throat> quite honestly, it's the thing that I'm not like giving to anybody <laughs> so I can show it. Um, I have been working on this lovely bowl of fluff. This is a 70-30 merino silk blend that my girlfriend Nicole picked up at Nicole. I don't call her Nicole. I call her Nick. So I don't know what that was. But anyway, um, Nick picked these, these uh, eight ounces of this up at the Fiber Festival of New England that we went to. And... Um, Asked me to spin it. <laughs> and sure, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I mean, we'll see what happens, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I am so sorry. I just have like a throat thing that is really, really terrible. Um, but anyway, uh, so I had applied a, a one, I applied four ounces, of, or I spun four ounces of it into singles. I have started plying. Um, you know, it's working out to be roughly a DK to worsted weight, uh, yarn. Um, so, I mean, I hope she likes it. It's, it's so beautiful. It's nice to spin with, um, in terms of it's just very slippery and easy and it drafts well and, I don't know, I'm enjoying it. Um, the color's very pretty. Um, you know, so I can say that that has been a bit of a pleasure to get into. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what she makes with it. Um, and that is, I mean, just the colors in it though. Like, like it's just so, this is, the silk is what makes it kind of shiny. But, you know, it's just got all these like dark and lights and... I mean, they're just so pretty. <sighs> um, so another spin that I have that I actually have had going for a little while, but I didn't really get back into it very much until just this past Saturday night. Um, we had some really severe weather here. I'm in Rhode Island. Um, so if you know about the weather that occurred around, um, Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island, uh, and surrounding areas, uh, this past weekend, we had several tornadoes touch down in various places. My daughter's got a huge, huge ass tree in the playground of her preschool. So now they can't go outside. Um, but anyway, uh, we lost our power around five o'clock in the evening, um, just before we started making dinner. Um, we, in, in the, like, over almost four and a half years that we've lived in this house have never lost power for any significant amount of time. Um, so that was 
interesting that it didn't come back on within an hour. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, so we did the thing. We put out the candles, which my husband, being from Long Island, like, apparently never, like, experienced a, uh, like, power outage. <laughs> <laughs> other than in like 2002 during the blackout in New York, which he says that like, I know what he's talking about, but I don't. Hi, honey. Um, but uh, it, so we lost the power, got out the candles. Of course, nothing was charged because we didn't know that it was going to be that. I knew it was supposed to rain, but I didn't know there was going to be like that kind of shit happening. Like I wasn't prepared for that at all. Like, I still thought I was making meatloaf, <laughs> you know, for dinner. Or, well, then my husband was because I got tired and I didn't want to. Um, but, <laughs> anywho, um, you know, we did the thing. We My husband played guitar. We played by flashlight and phone light and, um, you know, listened to my five-year-old complain <laughs> about how not fun it was to be in the dark. Uh all of that stuff. Um, and then we put the kids to bed. And, like, I had had a coffee at, like, 2.30. So there was no... Like, I had energy. And there was really not a whole heck of a lot for me to do. I mean, because I couldn't knit. I, I'm not... Like, I can knit some things in the dark. But... Or without looking. Um, I had worked on my sweater. But I had completed a... a I had completed the body. Bound off. And then I had to pick up for the sleeves and doing that without light and especially on a fairly dark yarn would not have been a good idea. So I decided to not do that. Um, I didn't have a pair of socks on the needles and I just didn't have anything else to do. And because my spinning wheel is electric, I couldn't spin. <laughs> However, what I do have is spindles. Um... You know, like, every, like they say, when you're spinning, like, all you need is to put twist and fiber. And all you need to do that is really literally just your hands. A stick can help. So, I have sticks with things on them that allow me to spin. And that's what I did. So, <clears throat> I had gotten this fiber when I went into a yarn shop. A local yarn shop, Twist in uh, Niantic, Connecticut, and I was looking to see what she had for fiber. Which I mean, honestly, like none of the shops really have a ton of fiber. The only thing that they mostly carry is Malabrigo Nube, or Nube. I don't know how you say it. Which is um, a merino, hundred percent merino fiber. Um, and I was cautioned against getting that for my first fiber to spin. Um, so I just happened to see a braid of it when I went to the store after I had started spin been spinning for a little while, and I decided to pick it up. Now, this is like half of it kind of pre-drafted and split up and broken down into little bits and stuff. But um, I decided to sit there on my couch and do some support spindling because... I haven't been doing it much at all. Um, I wasn't very good at it. And when you're not very good at it, if you're doing the spindling incorrectly, or not even incorrectly, but if you're not considering the ergonomics of how you're doing it, you can hurt your shoulders because it it does require you to have your arms in certain positions. And when you're not sure what you're doing and you're trying to figure it out, a lot of times you've got your arm jacked up way up here for a long period of time. And um, it would just hurt my shoulder. And I was busy playing with other things, so I didn't worry too much about getting better at it. And then we had a power outage, and I was like, okay, well, I guess this is the time to do it. <clears throat> so I... For a couple hours, sat and did some support spindling. Um, now, for those who don't know much about spindling, this is a spindle. There's one of many types of spindles. Um, I will show you that I have got... Five spindles. And there are... Basically, essentially, only two types here. Um, 
these three are all what you would call suspended spindles. So this is a Turkish spindle from Snyder Spindles. Spindles. Um, this is just like a little student one. This is actually like one of those little wooden wheels and a dowel and like a cup hook that you can put. Like you can make your own super easy. Uh, this is what we would call a uh, top whirl. Top whirl. Whirl? <laughs> <laughs> suspended spindle and it's actually still got fiber from when I was first learning on it um this is I think this is a louette which is actually was actually gifted to me by uh my local yarn shop the uh, driftwood yarns um they had a customer who wanted to um pay pay it forward and they had a copy of <clears throat> the Abby Frank Mott book respect the spindle and this top whirl drop spindle that they gave me and that was really awesome of them um sorry I just banged that on the table um for those who are not aware I am hearing impaired and so there's a lot of noises that you're probably going to hear that I may not be aware of um that just don't affect me the same way that they do others uh because I can't hear them or I don't hear them at the same inten intensity so I apologize for that. Um, so anyway, a top whirl or a suspended spindle works pretty much in the manner of the weight. Sorry, my daughter just woke up from her nap and she's crying in her crib and now she looks like she's falling back asleep. So... Maybe I've got another, like, minute and a half. Um, so, I can't, of course I can't do this when I'm trying to do it on screen and talk it to people at the same time. But, um, this works by pulling the fiber and twisting it, from, and it pulls it from the weight on the bottom. And then you wind it around this, and that's called the cop. And then when it's full... You take it off, and you start again. And that's just kind of how it goes. Um, why can't I get this? Oh, there we go, there we go. Okay, so this is there. All right, so this is called drafting. When you pull your fiber from your forward pinching hand and this is your drafting hand and then and I'm basically doing this for the people who don't have any clue what I'm talking about and then you just twist it or you flick it and it spins and that spin is sending twist up into the yarn up to where you've got your fingers pinched and now you've got yarn this would be called a singles because it is one single of yarn twisted so that's how a drop spindle works very rudimentary explanation uh, a supported spindle this is a Russian supported spindle this is some other type of supported spindle you use it in a little dish or a bowl and you spin it like this but in this one you would also have hold this up, spin it, let it do its thing, and because I, I still can't do this while it's spinning, you draft, and the twist goes up, and that makes yarn. And you spin it again, and you do the same thing over and over and over. Very meditative, meditative and relaxing. Um, so. Those are my current spins that I'm doing. Oh, uh, yeah, the fiber, the, the purpley, pinky fiber stuff is um, Malabrigan Newberry 100% Merino. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to leave you with a couple of book re recommendations for new spinners. Um, I wanted to do some more, like tips and advice for new spinners from a new spinner because there are so many good videos out there on YouTube 
and there's so many good articles and there's so many good books and things out there that can help you on your journey. Um, and there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of people who've been doing this for a really long time and it can feel very intimidating to see what they're doing with such a practiced method. Like they know what they're doing and they're good at it. And you're like, mm, that's not me. <laughs> um, so you can get a feel for what it's supposed to look like, but how do you get from what you're doing to what they're doing? Um, and that, the answer to that is tons of practice, like just practice and don't expect to be good at it and don't view any of what you've done as a waste because you've learned something from every possible thing that you've done. Um, you've either learned what to do or what not to do and what you like and what you don't like, which is almost probably quite on par with what to do and not do because what you like and what might be correct may not always be in sync and if you're a maker it doesn't have to be you can do whatever the hell you want so just do it uh but anyway a couple of good books for new spinners um i would definitely uh, this is like the, the the bible of the spinning world the fleece and fiber source book um it just tells you about um, more than 200 fibers from animals to spun yarn. So how you, like, what the fibers are supposed to look like, what they're good for, and how to spin, dye, or knit them, or crochet, whatever you're going to do with it. Um, tells you about the breeds of the animals and the information. And it's just, it's a, it's a great resource. It's good for you to know what you're spinning with and to know the background of it know why it's behaving the way that it is. There might be something that comes from a particular sheep that's better for socks, something that comes from a particular sheep that's better for a sweater, um, things of that nature. Uh, the next book I really want to recommend is, oh, and the Fleece and Fiber Source book is by Deborah Rob Robson and Carol Acarius. There we go. Yeah, I probably won't link any of this. Sorry, <laughs> my kid's already awake, so I don't know if I'll be able to get to that. Uh, the next book I want to recommend is Yarn Texture. Uh, this is by Jillian Moreno, and it's uh, subtitled uh, Knitter's Guide to Spinning, Building Exactly the Yarn You Want. In spinning, a lot of times you don't know how to get the yarn that you want, or you don't even know what you're going to get. And you just kind of blindly go, and you just end up with what you end up with, and then you figure out what to do with it. Um, this will give you some help on how to make a yarn that you want for a specific project, which can be very helpful, especially if you don't want to just end up with random skeins of, like yarn that you don't know what to do with because you already have 80 skeins of shit you don't know what to do with and the last book i'm gonna bring up and show again is the respect the spindle by abby frankmont um this is considered you know like the ultimate guide to spindle spinning um it was the one given to me i would have purchased it eventually had it not been given to me um and it's how i learned to spindle spin and, um, yes, I did watch some YouTube videos, but first I read the book and followed the instructions and followed the pictures because that's how I, I am better at learning that way for whatever reason. Uh, well, I know why, because when I watch videos, being hearing impaired, <coughs> excuse me, um, trying to follow verbal instructions, um, while I'm doing something, it's either very difficult for me to read the captions at the same time as I'm actively trying to do something. Um, or because I can't see the person's mouth because it's a voiceover, I can't fully understand what they're saying. Um, so there can be some barriers uh, for using videos for learning things for me as a hearing impaired person. Um, there are lots of ways to get around those barriers, but I just like to read a book and look at pictures and then figure it out and because I'm also older, like, videos weren't the, the way that you learned things when I started learning things on my own. Like, there were, you just didn't have that available to you. So I still default to a book with pictures, because <laughs> apparently maybe I'm also a toddler. Um, 
But anyway, um, so I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, I will. I did actually have some notes that I wrote on the inside of a ball band <laughs> that I found on my desk. Um, so I think I'll probably do a little bit better for the next time of having some notes down for things I would like to talk about. Um, I don't know if giving any bits of information as a new beginner spinner or new terms for people who don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. If it is, let me know in the comments below. Um, this is the obligatory, hey, if you like the things that I'm saying and talking about, give me a like, subscribe, share, all of those things. Um, you can find me on Ravelry as Manda Made It. Um, and I'm going to go get my screaming kid now. All right. Thanks, guys. And I'll talk to you soon.